Hello, everyone. This is Colleen Milton, and on behalf of Azuqua and 451 Research, I would like to welcome you and say thanks for attending today's webcast titled Accelerate Digital Transformation Through Hybrid Workflow Integration and Automation. Leading off the discussion today will be Carl Lehman, who is Principal Analyst of Enterprise Architecture, Integration, and Process Management at 451 Research. Following Carl will be Dan Kogan, who is Chief Marketing Officer at Azuqua. Just a few quick housekeeping items before we get started. To ask a question, uh, simply type it in the question box on the screen below. We will answer as many questions as we can during the Q&A session and will respond to all unanswered questions via email after the webcast concludes. This presentation and slides are available for download. And finally, please provide feedback at the end of the webinar. And with that, I'll turn it over to Carl. Uh, thank you, Colleen, and thank you all for joining us today to talk about uh, how to accelerate digital transformation through hybrid workflow uh, integration and automation. Um, I was asked by Azuqua to uh, put together some uh, research findings uh, that help address how best to uh, digitize one's business and share uh, the, our findings about uh, the next generation technology that enables um, emerging competitive enables competitive advantage in enterprises. For those of you who are unfamiliar with 451 Research, we're an IT research and advisory firm founded in 2000. We have over 250 employees, 100 of which are analysts. We serve the financial communities, IT community, and uh, enterprise uh, and user IT organizations. Uh, we base our research on uh, a very aggressive. Uh, a data research strategy where we have 50,000 IT professionals globally, which we pull on a regular basis to get their understanding of next generation technology trends, where they'll be investing, what are some of the challenges that they face. And we uh, use that to publish over 52 million data points across near 5,000 reports, and we cover 2,000 uh, vendors as part of our uh, research. I'm part of 451 Research's uh, AppDev, DevOps, and ITOps. Uh, research practice, and I focus on enterprise architecture, uh, integration, and process management. So today, what I'd like to do is kind of share with you um, a, a, a both a strategic and a tactical approach to uh, help digitize uh, your enterprise uh, and make you aware of the technology advances in uh, next generation uh, integration and workflow technology. So to do that, I'm going to talk about some of the business drivers. And I'm, my, my goal here is to give you a strategic decision framework within which to think through uh, how best to uh, exploit emerging technology that helps uh, satisfy the needs of your business, and then share with you how to structure that technology to, uh, to do just that. And then um, kind of sum it up with an, uh, with an overall uh, line of reasoning that uh, gives you the the, um, the decision framework you need to go forward in a in a digital transformation world. So to that end, let's talk about where we are today. Well, no analyst discussion would be complete without a discussion of digital transformation, and I'm sure we've all heard many of them over the course of the recent couple of years. Um, and fundamentally, if you look at the definition of digital transformation, it means using uh, new and enabling technologies, new emerging technologies to craft innovation in terms of customer journeys, uh, customer satisfaction, improve customer relationships, and also to improve operating efficiencies. Um, and so traditionally, you know, the definition has been focused on IT technology, but in reality, it's more than that. We have many more d and different types of technologies that we need to be aware of uh, in our industry because our customers may expect it. There may be a new opportunity that uh, we need to pursue based on emerging technology. And uh, it's not just about uh, IT. It's about you know, how to take advantage potentially, if, if, depending on your industry, of drones, on artificial intelligence, on nanotechnology, on robotics, real robotics, not you know, software robots, but real robots, things like ground penetrating, ground penetration radar and um, uh, and you know global sensors and, and IOT all of these are leading to um, next generation problems but I also present you know next generation opportunities 
And so we need to look at these technologies strategically in conjunction with the various IT technologies that we have at our disposal today. <clears throat> but it's more than just the technologies that enable digital transformation. Um, our rivals, either existing rivals in our market or uh, new aggressive entrants, uh, pose a, can pose a threat when um, they begin to offer um, services and information and capabilities that uh, change the mindset of the customers that we serve or the prospects that we hope to uh, sign up. Um, they come to market with um, little technical debt. They fully exploit the emerging technologies that can be available in the market today, and they use that to change the decision criteria in the minds of the buyers, in the minds of customers. Um, they typically you know, expose um, um, information that assist in the evaluation, comparison of, of goods and services. And so the buyers then, the customers, are, are empowered in new ways. And uh, it gets them to rethink how they buy things. And when they do that, if you're the incumbent um, vendor serving that customer, you're at risk. So this means that companies have got to enable, to the best of their uh, ability, new competitive advantage uh, on, in a consistent way. And new competi competitive advantage is a term that um, is used frequently, but I'm going to further define it uh, in, a, in, a, in a few slides from now. But na enabling new competitive advantage doesn't just mean that we take a look at how we do things and, um, and, and redesign them. Um, indeed, we need to reconsider how we buy things, how we make things, how we move things, and we sell things. We need to continue you know, our lean programs, Six Sigma programs, ISO programs, um, any type of uh, continuous process improvement program needs to be maintained. But in today's uh, environment, it, it needs to be thought of a little differently. We can't just look at our processes and how we deliver value to customers and you know, redesign them so they're a little bit faster or maybe a little bit more efficient. Um, we need to be a lot smarter and, and a lot smarter faster. And there's ways to do that, first from a strategic perspective and then ultimately from a technical perspective. From a strategic perspective, what I want to share with you is a concept called the adaptive loop. It's, it was published um, in a book called The Adaptive Enterprise uh, back in the 80s. And it, its design was to enable companies, enterprises, to rapidly sense and respond to change. And so this adaptive loop concept has basic four um, high-end um, capabilities. Uh, we need, as an enterprise, to be able to quickly sense change, need, opportunity, risk. We need to be able to put together processes in place to correctly interpret the degree of change, risk, opportunity, or anomaly so that we can properly uh, assess its impact on the enterprise, its impact on our customers, its impact on our financial performance, and then use that, that interpretation to make the relevant and right decision uh, as to how to proceed given what we interpreted from what we sensed, risk, change, opportunity, need. And then pull it all together and act on it consistently with the policies and rules that we put forward in our interpretation and in the needs of the enterprise and the expectations of the customer. So this is the kind of thinking <clears throat> that whenever we design a process or we engage in uh, digitizing our business, it's, it's, it's not just trying to you know, improve the customer journey or squeeze out more efficiency. We need to be able to sense and respond um, with, a, with an adaptive infrastructure that's well instrumented to be able to expose change, risk, opportunity, need faster than we have before. And this type of effort is already underway. As I mentioned earlier, we pull our 451 research community uh, frequently on a variety of topics. And in a recent survey, we asked them uh, about their digital transformation strategy. First, whether they had one, and then if they did, how were they planning on uh, executing? And so most of the companies with um, digital transformation strategies on the right, we call the leaders, 53% are, 
are adopting artificial intelligence and machine learning as part of enabling intelligent business applications. 41% are trying to migrate as much as possible to cloud-based infrastructure to support applications. 34% are investing in intelligent personalization. And this is not just from the consumer perspective, but it's also you know, contextual response for employees and business partners alike. And also 34% are shifting um, applications to the cloud, um, driving to you know, more of a SaaS-first model. Now, th these leaders kind of are distinguished from what we call the laggards. Fewer of the companies uh, are doing so, those typically without a digital transformation strategy. So <clears throat> this trend of you know, becoming rapidly aware and, ha and helping rapidly sense and respond to change, risk, and nominee opportunity is already underway. Um, and it's being done so through, by exploiting, as you might gather, many of the cloud services that are available to us today. Um, but we also asked those folks exactly, you know, what is your digital strategy? And um, basically, it, it, it is composed by those industry leaders as an integral uh, four-part approach. 46% um, believe that digital operations are a, a core part of that pro, um, that uh, digital strategy, and they're uh, prioritizing application awareness of context and presence, as I mentioned earlier. 37% um, state that um, you know mobile and cloud applications have a mobile or a cloud-first application as part of their digital experience. 32% believe cloud infrastructure is a priority. I don't believe I don't think that's uh, any uh, surprise to us. Um, and then 29% believe that digitizing their business processes to the best, as best as possible, is uh, core to enabling digital strategy. So when companies pursue this integral approach, they're, they're hoping to achieve you know, new competitive advantage. But that phrase, new competitive advantage, or competitive advantage in general, you know, in my view has been uh, frequently used, but uh, it's become vapid in some way to a lot of uh, people who hear it because it hasn't been properly defined. You know, there's a lot of different ways to enable competitive advantage. You know, you can own the patents to you know, a unique product and you're the only one that can make it. Uh, you own the mine that has the mineral that um, is, the, is the, the only source for that mineral. Um, you've got you know, massive capital that, uh, in a capital-intensive industry that creates a barrier to entry to your uh, rivals. So those are all kind of the traditional approaches at this point. But a lot of us don't have you know, that type of capability to create competitive advantage. So when you study all of the successful Fortune 500 companies, when you study all the major system integration the global think tanks, when you study all the master uh, programs from the top universities on the globe, the, it comes down to a common denominator. Competitive advantage is achieved when a company takes a close look at how they do things. Perhaps the most noted um, professional on the planet today that has pioneered research in this area is uh, Michael Porter of Harvard University, who published books, Competitive Advantage and Competitive Strategy. And uh, in, in those books, he's floated the notion of a, a, enabling competitive advantage by uh, examining your uh, value chain, meaning creating a systematic way of examining all the activities that a firm per performs and how they interact, activities and linkages, um, and then uh, design them in such a way so that you do the same things as your rivals but differently uh, and or you do different things that are acknowledged by customers to be superior to rivals and therefore they give you the biz the, the, you, they award you the business. So competitive advantage, while achievable in many ways, often in almost all cases has a common denominator. And that common denominator is how we do things. And that means doing the same things as rivals but differently and or doing different things that are superior to rivals. And another word for how is process. So how do we examine the activities and linkages, the processes within our firm's value chain, and then begin to apply the uh, adaptive loop concepts 
to our core business processes. You know, many companies um, have core business processes that they need to run their business, but when you ask them how many uh, business processes do you use to run your business, they'll say, they'll shrug, they won't know. But if you ask them uh, how many applications you use to run the business, they'll probably come up with a pretty close uh, number because they know specifically you know, how many applications they have licenses for and what they pay for that. But the point here is understanding the core business uh, processes of your value chain and then applying that adaptive loop analysis, being able to sense change, risk, and opportunity or need by customers or other factors in the, um, in the value chain quickly making the proper interpretation based on rules and policies or the degree of risk, change, opportunity of need, taking uh, action based on uh, the rules and policies of the enterprise and the strategic initiatives put forth by the company, what are your goals, what are your uh, key performance measures, etc., and then uh, executing upon that through a, an automated action of some way uh, is the way to enable competitive advantage. And when you combine an, an analysis of your processes through the value chain and the adaptive loop rapid sensor response set of concepts to how you design business processes and then codify business processes and applications and then integrate those applications, that helps you enable competitive advantage because what you're doing in this instance is enabling intelligent process automation. When you apply sense and respond, adaptive loop principles, to value chain analysis, and you can it, can it can rapidly sense, interpret, decide, and act. You've created an environment that enables an intelligent process automation. So that's the strategic concept that I wanted to share with you, because a lot of technology, a lot of discussions on digital transformation strategy kind of boil down to well, let's get the technology in place, and that's fine and well and good, and a lot of us on the, in this um, webinar are responsible for that. But I believe that the strategic analysis, the strategic thinking up front to help guide your decision making on how things need to be designed and implemented in technology, um, exploiting the concepts of value chain design and integration and interoperability and the adaptive loop is important. So now let's talk about some of the technology that we need to do this. Um, of the respondents that I mentioned earlier, those folks had a, a, an integral four-part approach to their digital strategy. Um, and what that means is if you're going to have an integral four-part approach to strategy, you need um, a, a, an integral um, approach to how you solve the problem. So some of the new ways that these enterprises are thinking about are kind of moving beyond some of the more traditional approaches. You know, in the past, We've had integrated development environments and service-oriented architectures, and they all work great. They got us to where we are today to build our applications to run our business, um, but they were complex and costly. And uh, application development techniques typically revolved around waterfall message, which uh, were systematic and you know got the job done. But you know it would take maybe a year and a half to get the next version of code out. That's completely unacceptable in today's environment. And they were built on pretty much monolithic architectures and data centers that didn't have a lot of adaptability or flexibility uh, built into them. Today, agile uh, development techniques are emerging and becoming more uh, popular in most enterprises. Uh, Cloud-native application development environment is preferred. And IT teams and, and business teams are doing a much better job of collaborating, uh, given some of the emerging tools that are available, and I'll talk about shortly or the emerging technologies that I'll talk about shortly. And they're doing a better job of you know, collaborating to prototype new designs. <clears throat> and they run across multiple execution venues. In, in this chart, we, uh, again, expose some um, survey work by our uh, IT community of decision makers, asking them, you know, at what rate are they going to migrate from existing you know, on-premises infrastructure to cloud services in the next two years. And uh, there's an aggressive migration path, if you will, towards infrastructure as a service and software as a service. Uh, and even um, hybrid and hosted architectures are um, becoming somewhat more popular. Um, so this kind of gives you a feel for the, the shift, the change um, uh, that uh, enterprises are going through right now. And to kind of explore that a little bit more deeply, you know, the application development strategy is, moving, is migrating more to 
a, 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 a development and oper a combined de development and operations uh, organization equipped with the relevant tools to do so. And a lot of those are based on low code, no to co code technology. But where enterprises want to head today and are heading today based on research is they want to fully exploit you know, shared distributed cloud architectures. They're making um, very aggressive inroads into ex first experimenting with and then deploying and running um, containerized applications, and they're decomposing or, or crafting new applications based on microservice architectures, which enable reusable code that can be dynamically assembled in a building block fashion. Um, and so this allows enterprises to very quickly you know, assemble logic, automate processes, and integrate and adapt. Those are fundamental principles for um, you know, enabling that adaptive enterprise, uh, that rapid sense and response capabilities. Uh, but it also has to include technology that, that tracks policies and rules management. A lot of the emerging technologies now um, have um, embedded policies and rules engines. Some of them call out to more sophisticated policy and rules engines. Um, but w but a, a lot, uh, probably the most common IT initiative in enterprises today is automating you know, various uh, development and uh, production uh, IT tasks. So. Continuous integration, continuous deployment is a means to rapidly develop and bring code um, to the market faster. <clears throat> and organizations are pushing together um, their uh, dev and ops groups uh, collectively into a common uh, organizational structure using common tools. Uh, so DevOps is pretty much on the march um, in most enterprises at this point. A lot of the software used exploits uh, low code, no code. That's a a, a, a set of techniques that are, are use visual models and prepackaged templates and drag and drop tooling to you know assemble logic, to assemble microservices, to assemble services in a uh, logical line of reasoning to produce applications, and um, it allows software to be configured rather than coded. A lot of companies, especially at the line of business la layer. Um, can't afford the time taken to develop applications from scratch or even to engage in a software in a waterfall based or more traditional IDE based software development environment they need to get the code out quickly and in a lot of line of business with um, the emerging platforms that I'm about to describe can do this in hours as opposed to, to weeks but they're, cater they're catering to the so-called citizen developer and citizen integrators these are the less technical folks who are responsible for projects, are business analysts, um, and they need to uh, react quickly. And um, they're beginning to you know, exploit low-code, no-code um, development environments to uh, create a framework, if you will, for the intelligent process automation that I described earlier. <clears throat> um, and so when they do that, though, they're able to compose applications as opposed to starting them from scratch. And so this creates a means by which uh, IT and business leaders can do a very good job of collaborating with one another. This changes, these low-code, no-code techniques um, change the way IT and um, biz lines of business can collaborate with one another. They, and not only that, but they enable uh, applications to be designed, tested, prototyped, developed, you know, modified, if you will, and deployed all in the same environment. So these next generation low-code platforms to enable intelligent process automation um, essentially create a poor man's, in my view, DevOps platform. You design it in the same environment that you run it. You test it in the same environment that you adapt it, and you can make changes as, as, as you require. So these, um, these types of capabilities go a long way to enable, help enable competitive advantage. Um, and it saves a lot of time. I mean, it could chop 90% or more off a development effort, effort depending on um, what you're trying to, uh, what you need to do. But the benefit of all this is they're very adaptive, which means that when you add machine learning and artificial intelligence, that's, that capabilities that are trained to execute the, that adaptive loop analysis that I described earlier within your value chain, 
um, you enable you can enable that rapid sensor response and intelligent process auto, uh, automation automation you can quickly sense change risk and opportunity when you instrument your business processes that run in your uh, in your low code um, you know new devops environment to be able to expose you know threshold changes or variants or trends and the more, the more quickly you can do that the more quickly you can interpret the more quickly you can uh, decide and the more quickly you can act and so these principles then enable the intelligent process automation and what's happening is they're starting to uh, be, become common capabilities in next generation platforms i call next generation application development environments that were based on you know business process management suites or other uh, platform as a service offering. I call those digital automation platforms. And the next generation integration tooling that um, brings all of this together and can rapidly and dynamically you know, assemble and execute logic across distributed architectures, I call those hybrid integration platforms. And when you start looking at the, the capabilities of what's needed to do this, you'll see something kind of interesting. You know, this is an example of we've got a variety of, you know, uh, business units that need to exchange data and execute a business process across each of their functions, and they must link to a variety of transactional systems or um, systems of record in some way, shape, or form. The, the platform needed to develop next generation applications or digital applications as I mentioned, the digital automation platform have these common capabilities. They have a UI UX environment. They enable collaboration. They use the low code, low, no code approach. They are com they have an integral workflow process engine, and they have a variety of templates and pre-configured services so that you can quickly drag and drop and enable uh, consistent logic. They can build forms. They can build documents. They include policies and rules, key performance indicators. They can track events when anomalies occur and help with remediation efforts. As I mentioned earlier, you, you develop and deploy in the same environment in many cases, so it enables you know its own continuous integration, continuous deployment, automation capabilities. It exposes uh, data for analytics, and in fact, in many cases, includes analytics. And in some cases, they include um, their own machine learning and artificial intelligence um, tooling. So this is kind of the, the capability set needed and part of digital automation platforms that are becoming the next wave, if you will, of application development as part of a DevOps strategy. By the same token, when you start looking at hybrid integration platforms, a lot of the same capabilities exist. UI, UX, collaboration, design, low code, etc. But there's a couple of differences. In the case of uh, hybrid integration platforms, the libraries and templates are used f to, to structure integration patterns. And there's various types of data and application integration patterns that, that can be addressed in these platforms. And rather than forms and documents, they, they uh, enable connectors and APIs in many cases. So basically, the hybrid integration platform looks a lot like a digital automation platform. They have the same capabilities, the same structure, but one focuses on application automation, and the other focuses on integration automation. And while they're uh, common architectural concepts in both platforms, they both perform completely different functions, and they both need each other. Digital automation platforms, right now need hybrid integration platforms. And hybrid integration platforms don't necessarily need digital automation, but they can be used in a broad range of use cases, uh, not only for application and application integration, but for business to business integration, hybrid cloud uh, architectures, and are composed of a variety of capabilities um, that enable um, competitive advantage, adaptive competitive advantage in the, and, and, and that distributed architecture that, that, that companies seek. Um, so when you combine uh, a value chain analysis doing the same things as rivals but differently or doing different things with adaptive loop principles where you rapidly sense, interpret, decide, and act, you think of a uniform platform across multiple you know, um, integral components of a strategy. Uh, you basically come up with next generation digital automation platforms and hybrid integration platforms. They become you know, the enabler or the unifying environment and capabilities needed for digital strategy. So in conclusion, um, it's no secret that rivalry and empowered customers change the way we need to look at our business and change the way we do things. 
Um, digital applications or digitizing one's business requires new means for application development, automation, and integration. Digital automation platforms, DAPs for short, unite the business and IT teams uh, around which they can rapidly prototype and design new business processes and new applications for use by customers, partners, and employees. Hybrid integration platforms, HIPs, are the digital accelerants, the enablers for all of this. Uh, nothing can happen in a distributed architecture without the guidance and control and the adaptability enabled by hybrid integration platforms now available on the market. And so when you combine that value chain, the adaptive loop, and the integral approach and unified platforms, you enable the competitive advantage that I described earlier. So with that, I hope I have given you some food for thought to link strategy with execution and share with you some of the core componentry of execution needed to enable your digital strategy. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dan Kogan, who can share with you uh, Azuka's perspective on the topic. Great. Thank you very much, Carl. And uh, for all the attendees in the audience, if you have questions for Carl, uh, please just go ahead and post those now in the Q&A pane. We'll have some time to get to those uh, towards the end of this presentation. Um, and if any questions during my talk track come up as well, uh, feel free to just post those as they come into the Q&A pane. So Carl, thank you again. Um, my name is Dan Kogan. I am the uh, Chief Marketing Officer at Azuqua. And what Azuqua is is a cloud-based digital process automation platform. So um, many of the capabilities Carl talked about in hybrid integration platforms and digital automation platforms um, are things that we have uh, within our tool. So I'll talk a little bit about the backdrop of really kind of why we created Azuqua. And we were founded in 2014. Um, and uh, out of Seattle, Washington, although we have customers uh, and, and people uh, around the country and globally. So the rise of SaaS applications and the ability to easily purchase and stand up new applications with no infrastructure and, and very little IT um, has really fueled digital transformation for a lot of companies. And uh, different business teams are able to purchase uh, best of breed technologies that do a specific thing very, very well. Um, myself, as a you know, as a head of marketing, uh, probably have 20 to 30 SaaS applications just just within kind of my scope and that my team uses on a day-to-day -day basis to to run our business, uh, and that's just for one department. So, and and for you know a relatively a relatively small company uh, as opposed to some of the very very large ones out there. So, this gets considerably uh, exacerbated. Um, the larger companies go, the more functions they have, the more customers they have, the more lines of business. And what we see are um, really over a thousand different cloud applications being used uh, across, various, across various industries on average. That creates pain for the IT teams who are tasked with providing governance and security and good quality data for analytics. Um, and really having a handle on the systems and um, maintaining the infrastructure and the enterprise architecture strategy. And frankly, even though each application serves a fantastic business need in and of itself, they also don't work that well or speak that well with other applications in use. And you start to see processes break down and more manual work having to happen and data silos and people not having the right information at the right time and the right tool. So that ultimately, that leads to a productivity drain uh, amongst the company's knowledge workers. So as we to kind of drill into that last point a little bit, this is a study from ServiceNow. Um, and what they found is digitization has really had a number of unintended consequences, if you will, across the business. Pains around lack of integration with other systems and tools, too many systems and tools, concerns around safety and compliance. Um, breakdowns of communications and collaboration between coworkers, learning curves for new tools, and data silos, ultimately. And further to that, what that ultimately leads to is people aren't able to do their best work. You know, we have 44% of managers saying manual work is the main reason for wasted time, and two days a week on average um, gets spent on manual tasks instead of strategic work. That's a huge productivity sink for, and, and really hard cost, for the most valuable resource that any company has, which are its people and its knowledge workers. So where Zuqua fits into this and really kind of why we were founded was to help solve this problem um, and to help really be the, be the tool that can easily stitch together the tools, the data, 
uh, and the processes around them. So it's helping business teams automate their business critical processes, uh, really built for the cloud, but reaching back into those legacy on-premises systems and helping IT teams standardize and govern the technology and really allow their business teams to move faster in a controlled fashion. Um, so we uh, are trusted by some of the world's leading brands, um, Hulu, Nike, Starbucks, um, Netflix, Airbnb, a number of others, and working very, very closely with actually the SaaS companies themselves, some of whom use our product within their product uh, and embedded as part of their offering to help address their customers' Uh, their customers integration challenges, others um, such as Zendesk that refer us very, very commonly to their customers um, to solve their integration problems and, and automate their workflows. And connecting really across uh, hundreds of applications uh, out of the box with pre-built connectors and tooling to connect to anything with an API out there. So there's really kind of three key tenets to the Azuka platform. One is an intuitive no-code visual designer, and I'll give a, I'll give a look into that in a second, um, allowing people to do things that are incredibly complicated and powerful, um, but in a, in a manner that doesn't require uh, coding background or, or even technical skills, really it just requires knowledge of the business process and what you're, what you're ultimately trying to do with the data from a system. Uh, and then reliability is a core tenant of the platform. Traditionally, with integrations that are code heavy, um, there's room for human error in writing the code, um, handling scale and load of different data volumes and spikes in transactions and things like that. Those are some of the legacy problems with non-SaaS integration platforms. It's a very, very hard thing to, to really architect around, uh, and that's something that uh, we strive to do with our uh, full SaaS platform. So we'll walk through a little bit of the, what the Azuqua Visual Designer looks like now. Um, it's really, um, I'm sorry, before I jump into that, or it, actually the slides didn't seem to load there. Um, we think about this as a cycle of digital transformation and really um, enabling, enabling a virtuous cycle of IT and business working together to uh, integrate data from different systems around common business processes making the most of the technology and giving IT visibility there, and ultimately helping people, um, both customers and employees, get the most out of, out of their data, out of their applications, um, surfacing the right information in the right time, at the right place, to the right people, um, which ultimately builds for the best employee experience and uh, the best customer experience. So there's, as we'll jump into the product a little bit and kind of walk through this on a screen by screen basis. We start with a no code visual designer that really kicks off with an event, uh, is what triggers some sort of behavior from the system. So in this example, uh, we have a record getting created in Zendesk. And when that happens, we want something to happen in another system. So in this case, we show, um, we want when a record gets created in Zendesk, that record gets duplicated over to Salesforce. So it's as simple as, connecting to that, authenticating in the system, and saying, giving the action based on the event in Zendesk of a new ticket, the action is a record gets created inside of Salesforce. The fields for that record um, in Salesforce from Zendesk and the information from Zendesk get mapped out. Um, functions can get added of what you want, of what else you want to have happen, so in this case, we also want to be able to compose a message that's going to surface in another application as part of this process. Um, everything, again, is, is no code based, just drag and drop, or just typing, as we've done in that message. It's freeform text in the compose function. We show the data. We visually slide over the data that we want to move from Zendesk into Salesforce. And we map that into the string function, or into the, uh, into the text function. Add one more action. In this case, we want to send, in addition to creating a record inside of Salesforce, we want to send that information to Slack in real time as well, to a specific channel, so uh, potentially the customer support channel, so they're all aware that a, a new ticket has been created, or maybe the account management channel in this case, that they see that uh, their customer is having a support issue, and they become aware of it proactively. Uh, and then all of that support data from the ticket not only goes into Salesforce, it goes into Slack for real-time notification as well. 
So a process like that can be created literally in a matter of minutes on the fly uh, without, without having to write a single line of code and then can work across any number of tens to thousands of people inside of the organization who use those systems and tools and want to have that data in real time. Obviously, if you're creating a number of processes, you need visibility, you need to understand what's happening across them. Um, and so that's available uh, in a dashboard view of all the different app, all the different automations and integrations that run through the system. Uh, history across what's worked and what hasn't worked in terms of uh, the um, in terms of the automation and where potentially an error has occurred or uh, or something hasn't processed within the system. Table storage for when you want to actually store data locally for part of a process. You bring data, you can move data all the way through from one application to another, or potentially you want to store it for another follow-on action. And we can store up to 100,000 rows of information within the system. Uh, connector builder tooling for the API developers within an organization, uh, both at SaaS companies, but even internally, a number of our customers um, use our product to not just connect to public SaaS applications that are well known like Salesforce or Zendesk, but to their own internal databases uh, that they expose an API and build connectors for. Uh, error handling built in, so being able to really, really tightly identify the point of breakdown within any type of an integration and error and fix that. Um, that is, people that would do integration for a living know can be a real challenge if you have to map out an entire integration and then if there's an error trying to find where it actually happens in that chain, and that's something we, we do very, very easily. And really, again, bring together a no-code visual designer, a function library uh, with over 165 different logic functions, the connector builder tooling, uh, multi-level security and role-based access controls, uh, distributed architecture with real-time process balancing capabilities, so um, processes are, are run quickly and efficiently, uh, the 100% no-code model, um, the ability to run um, as a fully managed SaaS service you don't have to worry about, or potentially to run within your cloud environment on AWS, uh, GCP, or Azure, the ability to run securely uh, across on-premises data, um, white label deployments and OEM deployments for platform uh, for SaaS platform companies, um, and uh, the ability to scale uh, scale out um, for heavy load periods, anticipated demand, which again leads to that reliability component. So I encourage folks to really get started learning more about Azuqua today. Um, you can go to our website. Uh, there's real people standing behind the chat there too that can answer any questions as they come in real time. Um, we're happy to show a custom demo around your solution and also get you started uh, with a free trial. So with that, uh, I will pan things back to Colleen and we can, we can go through any questions that you have for Carl or for myself. Thanks, Carl and Dan. It's time for a Q&A session. As a reminder, simply type your question in the box below and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so the first question is actually for Carl. What do you see holding customers back from adopting hybrid integration and digital automation platforms? So um, I guess the most uh, typical, um, I, I wouldn't even call it resistance, but it's lack of awareness. A lot of, uh, a lot of these platforms immediately, can immediately benefit a line of business um, and because they can, you know, quickly codify a process and uh, and expose it for use in a very short period of time, while linking it to a variety of different backend systems that it needs to link to. Um, and uh, a lot of the line of business folks who could best benefit from it don't necessarily, you know, do the research into those platforms. They rely on their IT organization to do that, and the IT organization may or may not make that a priority because um, they've got. It, they've been investing over the years in other types of platforms, and so they're some, in some cases saturated. Um, in other cases, they may not be saturated, and they may need um, tools like this. So they'll look at it from, a, from an enterprise perspective. But still, the people that benefit most and soonest are the various line of business managers and departments, and so uh, they need to become aware of this. When they realize their IT organization cannot, you know, uh, address their needs in a in a timely fashion, 
that's when they kind of go out and seek either a SaaS application or if there's no SaaS application that meets their needs, they'll discover a, a digital automation platform and hybrid integration technology. And, you know, that's when, you know, the, the pace picks up. But so it's not any technical barrier or, or, or even cost or anything like, or complexity is nothing like that. It's just simple awareness that's, that holds companies back sometimes. Thank you for that. Um, we had a couple questions come through for Dan. First question, what are some of the most tangible benefits you've seen customers achieve with Azuqua? It's a great question. It, uh, it, it depends um, what the benefit level be really kind of around the process itself that you're running. But if I think through a few examples, we recently had Aramark uh, as a customer present their, their story on a webinar, and uh, that was for automating their RFP process across Salesforce and, and Dropbox and, and Smartsheet as project management tool there. And uh, with the hundreds of RFPs they're, they're doing in their busy season, they were saving 40 hours a week amongst that team, which is a uh, quantified that as essentially, you know, one, one person or, or a full-time employee's time there. Um, so it could be, you know, $100,000, $200,000 fully loaded on that one. In the case of HubSpot, who uh, will be doing a webinar with us later this month as well, another customer, uh, their entire customer onboarding process is automated through Azuqua. Um, and uh, they've noted that what now takes 10% of one FTE's time to kind of manage and build the automations and, and keep an eye on everything uh, would have taken four FTEs on a uh, on an annual basis to kind of keep up with the customer onboarding processes if they didn't have a tool like Azuqua uh, automating a lot of the work. So uh, now we're getting into several hundreds of thousands of dollars of annual impact. Um, and then one of our customers who's one of the largest um, consumer goods products in the world uh, is using Azuqua to uh, automate price verification from all of their suppliers and contract manufacturers essentially, uh, versus that was a manual process uh, previously with people kind of checking back what contract, uh, what their manufacturers are charging versus their internal uh, systems and that had um, their, their internal price books that was fraught with uh, a number of human errors and just, just time intensive. Uh, so once that's fully operational, they'll be saving tens of millions of dollars a year um, through that type of a process. So. Uh, you can have the range from very, very small to it saving one person or a handful of people hours and hours a week to all the way to uh, tens of millions of dollars in impact depending on the business process. Great, thank you. And another question for you, Dan. How do business and IT teams collaborate around a tool like Azuqua? Yeah, that's a really good one. So. In, in an ideal world from an IT's perspective is they're controlling access to the systems themselves and who has admin permissions or what types of permissions they have within the systems and visibility into that. Um, and they are granting the right level of access to the right people, allowing them to design their integrations and automations as they see fit, but then keeping an eye on everything that's happening across the company and seeing if everything's working right, if sensitive data is being moved or not, um, things that violate different policies and controls. So IT is really playing an enablement empowerment role um, with full visibility and control and letting the business kind of move at the pace they need to and, and ultimately build good process and data quality around the systems that they probably went off and kind of bought on their own um, and stood up without IT much involvement. So it's bringing those two groups back together again and. Uh, I'll give a final plug to that HubSpot webinar uh, at the end of at the end of August, where that will be their business and their IT team uh, members together talking exactly about that process of how they got started, and uh, work together to really kind of make a, a corporate wide rollout around a, a system and process. All right. Well, thank you so much for submitting your questions. That concludes today's webcast. As a reminder, the on-demand replay will be available on Bright Talk soon. On behalf of Azuqua and 451 Research, thank you so much for attending, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.